Thanks for listening to the Belonging House Fellowship Podcast. Here is this week's message from Chris John Otto and the House of Artisans. Hey, welcome everybody. We're doing something a little different this week and that we're having questions. So I'm going to open up the chat window. Be care- Rosie, you put the first, Rosie's question was, what do you think? Don't ask me that. That's dangerous. <laughs> what do you think? Blah! No, uh, we're going to, they need to be a little more uh, focused on that question. But we'll start with this first question, which is from Susanna. Now, I've not seen this before. So bear, you know, anything can happen. How to live free of a religious, how do you live free of religious spirit? Can you actually give us examples of thinking that is affected by a religious spirit? Okay, let me, that's, we'll do that in reverse because the examples of what a religious spirit looks like are innumerable. And what's fascinating about the religious spirit is that it doesn't matter the religion. The religious spirit doesn't care. As long as you have lots of religion, it doesn't care. So the first thing that's clear about a religious spirit, and this is the fundamental thing, is that you have to do something to make God happy. That's the foundation. And and when you start to feed this thing, it is never satisfied. And so you have to do more and more and more. And you'll see Buddhists do this. You'll see Hindus do this. If you're Jewish, if you get into like Chabad, which is the ultra-Orthodox Lubavitcher sect, you you can never do enough mikvahs. You're always adding something new. And it's an endless, endless monster. How it manifests in evangelical charismatics is you can't, you have to pray more. You have to go to more meetings. You have to go to more conferences. So see, it's 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 everywhere. So so this is how the thinking is. So the first thing is, I would say that the fundamental thing is first, you have to do something to make God happy. The second example of religious thinking, I think, is that I am bad and God is mad. And so it's the orphan spirit. You can never do enough to make God happy. I'm bad. God is mad. And no matter what I do, if I do, you know, I always have to placate and do something to make God happy. So, and you see this, you know, you see this with missionaries a lot who go on the mission field because they're trying to make God happy. And then they're unhappy on the mission field. You see this uh, when I was a kid, it was the ladies at church who volunteered for everything. So it's not a Protestant Catholic thing. It's not a Christian thing. You know, it, it, it is a universal thing. And it's closely related to witchcraft. Because you're trying to control and manipulate the spiritual realm through your activities. That's the foundation of the religious spirit control manipulate dominate so you're trying to have power eventually you're trying to have power over god and it will lead you astray so how do we live free a religious spirit how do we live free of the religious spirit well the holy spirit first in order to live free of the religious spirit first of all you have to stop i think the most important thing you can do when you're getting over this is to stop doing things And it will be contrary to everything in you if you've bought into it. God, when you get to know God, you find out that the most important thing you can do is learn how to receive. So the more you learn to receive the Father's love, the more you become a child, a son, or a daughter. So it says in the beginning of Romans, so Romans 7 is is an expression Paul is writing to Jews who know the law and know that the more you do things, the less you're going to be, succeed. So he, the, the Romans 7 is all about the religious spirit. 
And how does that end? It says, oh, wicked man that I am. I This is what I what I want to do, I cannot do. And so I keep doing things I do not want to do. And then Romans 8 begins with, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life sets me free from the law of sin and death. So the law of sin and death is the religious law. The law of the spirit of life is the law of Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ took it all upon himself. Jesus Christ made God happy. I am in him. He is in me. And if he is in me, then the Holy Spirit is in me. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can say, Abba, Father. And I can rest. And I don't have to do anything. And it's in that place of rest. What's really interesting is when you come into this place of rest, God will often give you more to do. And you'll suddenly get busier. Because the life is flowing through you. And that is very, very different than the religious spirit because you're, the religious spirit is me-centered me motivated. And I'm always trying to do something in my own strength. And it's a miserable thing. Um, so does that did, did that answer your question, Susanna? All right, great. Super. I love this. What do you think? Next question is from Marguerite. How is God our defender? The hymn, O Worship the King, says God is our shield and defender, redeemer and friend. Absolutely. Very good theology. Actually, I believe that hymn is a paraphrase of one of the Psalms. Scripture, this phrase, our, you know, Psalm 46, it might be Psalm 46, which is God is our refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. Um, Psalm 91, they he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And then the next eight, nine verses are expressions of practical applications of that. You will tread upon serpents. Things will come at you one way and flee from you. Uh, you will not be afraid of pestilence or, or famine. So God is our refuge and defender is first of all, Jesus Christ, back to this idea, Jesus is living in us. If you are a believer in Jesus, if you're in the Messiah, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the, the dead, lives in you. So Jesus is in you. So if Jesus is in you, God is in you. So anything that comes at you in life, if you are living in that place in Jesus, anything that comes at you has to come to him, deal with him. And what does scripture tell us in Ephesians? It says that, and in Colossians, it says that when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, he became head over all things. So if Jesus is over all things, then everything has to bow and obey to him. So that's just one aspect of how God is our redeemer. There's another one, wonderful promise in scripture that says that if we walk in love with God, we will be at peace even with our enemies. I just love that. God gives us favor. There's one, there's another example. Zechariah chapter 2, 5. It says that the glory of God will dwell with us and be a wall of fire around us. So the promises, and we go back to De Deuteronomy 28, which you, you hear me quote all the time about the blessings promised to Israel that become our blessings in the new covenant. The, 
your enemy will come against you one way and flee from you seven ways. You will be the head and not the tail. You will be the lender and not the borrower. You will not be shaken about by life, but you will shake life because God has blessed you. All of this is, these are the benefits of being in relationship with the Lord. So those are just a few examples of how God is our defender. But how do we activate this? This is, this is great theory. I've just spouted off to you. So how do we activate, live in this? Well, first thing, you have to make a de decision that you are going to let God fight for you. And this is really tricky. And, you know, it was it was recovery that helped me with this. You know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So in order to let God fight for us and be our defender, we have to get out of the way. God can't defend areas that we haven't given to him. Uh, Isabel Alam this weekend said something brilliant. She said that God cannot bless our emotions. He can only bless our decisions. There's something to think about. So you have to release things to God. So as long as you're holding on to it, because God's given us our free will, we can fight all our battles we want. And a lot of people do. You know, a lot of people think that if you fight your own battle and then you ask God to bless it, it'll be great. No, you have to really let God fight for you. And that that's hard for a lot of people. You know, we want to fight. And one of the, you, soon you discover Jesus as well. Okay, you have to forgive your enemy. You have to bless your neighbor. You have to bless your persecutor. You have to pray for those people who've hurt you. Ah, and then he'll bless, then he'll defend you and he'll fight for you. And that God, you know, and here's another one. People often pray for, for uh, they want vengeance. They want God to bring vengeance for them. No, God's not going to do that. God's going to work it out for good. You can't, I can't tell you how many times I've had, you know, wanted to get revenge on somebody. And God said, well, that's my job. You need to let go of that. You can't. And, and we have lots of Christian revenge, you know, we have, we want, we want the person who hurt us to stand up in public and publicly apologize and all things like that. And, and, and if you think, oh, Chris, you're just a naughty person. I know every one of you thinks things like this. We all do. It's normal stuff. It's normal stuff. But the tricky thing that you, you won't experience God fighting for you if you, if you lock into that. You have to forgive. You have to bless. You have to be in Jesus. You have to be in love with Jesus. You have to walk with Jesus. Make him your dwelling place. And then he fights for you. So did that did that answer your question? Well, can you continue? How does he how can you? I think I know, but how do you make him your dwelling place? How oh, she gets two. Did you see this? She got two questions. Oh, <laughs> how do you make him your dwelling place? Actually, that's a very good question. So uh, you you make the Lord your dwelling place. Part of this is in your imagination and in your mind. You, you know, people don't want to talk about this because it's so, they talk about theology, but it's all vague. You have to practice the presence of the Lord. And some of that means you just have to pretend that you're in him. Uh, I remember one time I was praying and and while i was praying i had an image of jesus standing in front of me and he was had his hands out stretched to me and then in front of him a door opened up inside his white robe and he said come in will you walk in will you sit in me and and he invited me to walk through this door and sit in him i thought that was really it was very helpful to me actually and I did that, but but it it is, you have to let your mind and emotions take you to that place where you are seated in him. And you have to choose. 
And this goes back to this religious thing because, you know, this is very unreligious. So a religious system would say, you have to say 50 prayers for 20 minutes every day before you'll be able to be in this place. It's not very helpful. I know people who try to do this and, you know, God in his mercy will let you do it that way for a while to get there. Um, I, I remember this wonderful teaching. I think I made everybody listen to it once of Benny Hinn talked about coming into the presence of God and Benny Hinn said, oh, you can play worship music for a little while and I'll put you in the mood, you know, and now you'll be in the presence of God. He said, but that's, that's not where you need to end. You need to be able to just come into the presence of God. And it is something that we do, we activate by faith. But when we do that, then we can sit there and we can, the, then the tricky thing is learning how to do that through life. Can you do this when you're doing the dishes? Can you do this while you're driving, when you're on the train, when you're on a bus, when you're in the office, when you're at the registrar at the de Department of Motor Vehicles and you're trying to deal with this feisty woman who won't give you what you want. Those are some examples, but all right, well, we're going to move on to the next question, which is from Rosie. Is it biblical to say that we need to be covered by a pastor? What is true covering in the Bible? Is there such a thing? And then she says, whoops, three questions. <laughs> She's, these are sneaky people, all these multiple questions. This is a brilliant question, actually. I'm so thankful you asked it because it is one that comes up a lot. Um, it came up again this week. Somebody wanted to know, you know about my ordination process and everything. It's a complicated story involving the global realignment of the Anglican Church. So not an easy, not an easy answer. <clears throat> so... First of all, the word covering, this biblical, the phrase covering, so-and-so is your covering, blah, 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 is not biblical at all. I can't give you a Bible verse to back this up because it's an unbiblical idea. And I can tell you where it came from. I won't name names, but it came from the shepherding movement in the 1970s that became a abusive cult-like movement within the church. The interesting thing is the people were brought to account. It was discredited, but all their rotten ideas became generally accepted by the church and are still being taught today. I think this is really interesting, this bad idea about covering, and you'll hear about it all the time. It comes up a lot in our ministry because of all the artists that we deal with and people who are free thinkers and outside the, the don't fit in the, the, the church grid very well so this whole thing so this idea about covering is basically that if you are out on your own without somebody above you you're out of alignment and you're in danger and this came up a few weeks ago if you want to go into the tuesday prayer talks uh youtube videos i talked about a biblical cosmology of prayer in how this comes into the prayer movement with people saying that they're my covering in prayer and that they're my intercessor that's been assigned to me by God. And this is the same idea, which is that I can't do ministry unless there's a lot of people praying for me. And these people I have to answer to. And then what they do is they try to have power over me. And, and this is the thing. It's about power. This is very this is a Roman grid because what it says is that you can't do something unless there's someone in the hierarchy above you. And what's really interesting is that a lot of these places are independent churches. So the covering is a person who has no covering. And and they may be parts of networks, quote unquote, or streams or whatever that are supposed to be their covering. But let me tell you, these high-powered pastors in these church, these kinds of things, nobody, they're not accountable to anybody. They're just in these groups and they're not accountable to anybody. I think you all know that I have more than one person in my life who can who has permission to ask me any question at any time. 
that's that's real. That's a real relationship. For years, you know, because this this covering thing came up a lot when I started Belonging House. And I was out there by myself and my former denomination came after me more than once, trying to punish me for being on my own. And I said, well, who are you going to call? I'm not part of you anymore. And they got very flummoxed because they realized that what I said was true. So I went to my board and I said, we need to be aligned with somebody. So we were, pro I think we were aligned with five different organizations at some point. And you'd recognize all the names if I told you who we signed up with. And they all fell badly by the wayside and just cost us money. The funniest one was an organization that was supposed to be my covering. And we sent, you know, sent them checks every month and they were supposed to send me teaching and a person was supposed to call me. And there was all this stuff that was supposed to happen. They didn't do any of it for a year. And so I canceled it. Well, they immediately contacted me and said, why aren't you, why are you withdrawing from our covering? And I said, well, you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you didn't do this and you didn't do that. They were so embarrassed that they sent me this case. They went to their warehouse. They got every teaching, every book, every magazine that the that they had put out for like X amount of years. And they sent me this giant box of all this stuff. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with this? I said, well, that doesn't make it any better. Because then I was moving and I had to get rid of it all. So all that to say, your covering is Jesus Christ. Just like your only intercessor is Jesus Christ, your covering is Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, all the ministry things are not hierarchical. That is a Roman concept. So, you know, you've heard me talk about the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Your hand is not a hierarchy. If I lop off one of these fingers, your hand is not going to function fully. But we see we see this as a as a hierarchy that the apostles on the top, then there's the prophet, then there's the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher, and all of us are down here, and we're little people, and we are not to we don't strike the Lord's anointed. How many of you heard it? You know, how many of you ever heard this? The New Testament is not this. The New Testament is this. It's really interesting. And God is changing these things right now, you know, and restoring this original intent of, of, a, of, of something that works organically. The most important thing for you is to love God, love other people, and be in relationship. God will ask you to do things, and you know, God will confirm it. And you don't have to worry if you're out there on your own, you're not doing something wrong. There'll be a lot of Christians who'll tell you you are, but it's but they're not right. And they can't give you chapter and verse to back it up. That answer your question? That was a lot of stuff. So, yeah. So, all right. Here's a question from Elizabeth Averill, also from Israel. Two questions from Israel and one from Canada, one from London, so wide swaths. Often you've said that some types of prayer, oh boy, are a form of witchcraft. How do we pray using scripture and declarations appropriately? I'm learning to wait and listen, but want to grow in this area. And emotions are not reliable, as you just stated. And then she says, you can ignore this question if you need to. I'm not going to ignore this question. This is a good question. Because I have to pray about this every day. So back to this religious spirit thing. These questions are all, everything's kind of dovetailing today. Interesting. So back to the religious spirit. So the... Graham Cook, or not Graham Cook, Derek Prince said that the na natural religion of man is witchcraft. And I would say, I would, I would uh, 
probably adjust that a little bit and say that the natural religion of man is pagan. Paganism and witchcraft are the same thing. So when you hear about you know neo pagans, that's witchcraft. So witchcraft is the attempt to control, manipulate, and dominate. So you can tr try to do things to control the spiritual realm in order to manipulate the spiritual realm in order to dominate other people and things and situations. And, and witchcraft and all pagan religions have this in common. This is why Christianity and Judaism are oppositional to everything else in the world. Because witchcraft is the world system. Okay? So, um, so a person, you know, and, you know, Derek Prince gives these examples of little children who's cry and whine to get things when they're very young and they figure out that if I can cry and whine mommy will pick me up and hold me so this child is learning very early on how the world works and that I can manipulate mommy through crying and whining and by two years old that becomes uh, temper tantrums so we learn other ways that are more socially acceptable to get people to do things so the same thing happens in prayer. There are people who will learn prayers and they'll say, hey, this worked. And then they'll say, if you, you know, you just pray that there are all kinds of books. You know, there are lots of books of these kinds of prayers. If I just read this, this, do this one simple trick, God will get me get. Well, that's trying to manipulate God. Then what you'll have, going back to this thing about covering and intercessors, you'll have people who come along, and I've had this happen a few times, they'll show up on my doorstep and they'll say, God told me that I'm your intercessor and God called me to intercede for you. And often this person will have prophetic words and words of knowledge that are right. And then... If you're innocent and naive, like I was at one time, you'll say, okay, you welcome them in, and then they become real trouble. Usually people like this are operating in a Jezebel spirit, which is a spirit of witch witchcraft. And their only goal is to control, manipulate, and dominate witchcraft. And you usually don't know that they're a problem until you say no to them. And with a person who's operating in this, the word no is like a trigger mechanism that will turn them into destructors. And some of you have seen this play out in our ministry. We've had to pray out a few people over the years. And so, so when we're talking about a, a witchcraft prayer, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. People who are coming in, they're using their authority in Christ to try to manipulate and control other people. So Christians can curse other Christians in prayer. And you do see this. And it's a very powerful thing because they're using their authority in Christ, real spiritual powers flowing through them. And this is the scary thing. They're feeling spiritual power, but they think it's the Holy Spirit. And it's not. It's second heaven. So, so how do we not do this? Well, first of all, don't try to control people. You know, there, you know, there was a situation today and I asked the Lord what to do about it. And he said, keep your mouth shut. Listen, I was with Liz that I had earlier today. And the Lord said, keep your mouth shut. It's not my circus, not my monkey. You don't pray about things that aren't your circus, aren't your monkey, aren't your responsibility. It's an open book. You know, every day I say mass for the community. And every day I have a list of people that I pray for. I'll show you the list. Do I have it? I don't have the book right next to me. 
you know, I have a list. I don't pray. God's given me a list of people to pray, and I name those people before the Lord. The Holy Spirit is on that. I just named their names before Jesus. I don't say anything. You would not believe, and you all, everyone in this call is on this list. You wouldn't believe how many things God does in your lives because of this prayer. But I didn't say anything. Isn't that interesting? You know, praying scripture and making declarations. Praying scripture and making declarations does shift things. But what it really is about is aligning our hearts and our heads with the Lord. You know, we... You've heard me talk about my prayer book, I'm praying my prayer book. I don't pray my prayers out of the book for God. I don't pray those prayers out of the book for God. I'm not doing it to make Jesus happy again. I'm praying those prayers out of the book for me. And I did it a long, long time before I realized that's what was happening. I'm saying these prayers because the scripture is going in. It's on my lips. And I'm coming into alignment with the mind of Jesus. And as I come into alignment with the mind of Jesus, everything in my life changes. Because God says that if I have the mind of Christ and I'm in alignment with Jesus, then I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to be defended. I'm going to be protected. He's going to be with me. He's going to meet my needs. I'm going to have favor going to have persecutions, but I'm going to share in the pain, but I'm going to share in the glory. And that's a very different way of understanding prayer than it's often understood. Because we don't pray in a utilitarian sense. We pray to have a relationship with Jesus and join his prayers in the prayers of all heaven. So that, that's not witchcraft. You won't slip into witchcraft when you're in that place. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And I needed every word of it, but thank you very oh, much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, we have time for one more, and there aren't any more on the list. Does, does, do we have one more? What did you think of the phenomenon of the book, The Prayer of Jabez, and what do you think of it now? That's really interesting. That's a good follow-up question. That's from Martin. The Prayer of Jabez was a fascinating phenomenon. Uh, Dave Wilkers Wilkinson, was it Dave Wilkinson? The 1990s. Um, it was around the Toronto period. He wrote three books, and he planned it from the beginning to be a trilogy. Prayer of Jabez is, uh, oh, that you would bless, me. Lord, that you would bless me indeed. Do you know the prayer? Who can, I can't remember. Some of it came out of my mouth the other day when I was walking. Oh, that you would bless me indeed, that you would increase my territory, that you would strengthen my hands and that I would not cause anyone pain because his name meant pain. Right. And that book went crazy. And, you know, I prayed that prayer for years. It really works. Back to this whole, you know, we're all in a journey. You know, most of the things that I say are wrong. It's because I did them before. Oh, that you would bless me indeed, enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and keep me from harm, that I would be free from pain. Right. That's good. And God granted his request. So, you know, and this is a beautiful example of learning to put the scripture, what's beautiful about that prayer is that all of it is scriptural. It's They're all scriptural principles everywhere. So we're coming into God's alignment. We're coming into alignment with God. People were really touched by it. And of course, you know, in the United States, 42, probably 42% uh, are regular attending churchgoers. So it's very easy to sell millions and millions of books to that audience once, the, once it gets around. What's really interesting is the second book in his series was about 
John 15, 5, about the vine and about pruning. And, and of the books that he wrote, I never read the third book. I read the first two. No one read the, the second book didn't take off because that was a painful book. It's about pruning and coming into alignment with God's will. After you learn how to be blessed, then you learn how God grows things. Well, our Tuesday prayer group knows that that book has had a huge impact in my life because I taught on John 15, 5 for over a year at the Tuesday prayer meeting because it's such a principle of prayer. And this is that we come into the life of the vine, the life flow. So we have to learn how to remove the obstacles of that life flowing in our lives. And when we do that, God speaks to us. We come into agreement with what God says. And John 15 says that if we do that, we're in him. And if we're in him, in Jesus, we can ask anything in his name and he will do it. And then if God does it, we will bear fruit and this will make our joy full and our father will be glorified. And then it says, my father is the vine dresser. And anyone who bears fruit, he's going to prune. And if you get pruned, you will bear more fruit. Well, we all think that, you know, the, the Christian life is like the stock market. And you put in, you buy stock and you... And it gradually just cre increases incrementally over time. And then you take your dividends and you buy more stock and it grows that way. And then you buy more dividends and you keep going. And there'll never be a crash because you just keep going up and up and up and up. Well, this is not at all how the Christian life works. And a lot of people start ministries this way. And that's a topic. No one's asked that question, so we won't talk about this. But this is the interesting thing, and we know this in our house because we, because I live this way. We listen to the Lord and do what he tells us. And so what happens when you listen to the Lord and do what he tells you? You discover the life of the vine. And God gives you words, and you start praying those words. And what happens? We bear fruit. And then what happens? What happens? Who 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 knows what happens next? Oh, you're all muted. Everybody's making hand signals and stuff. Um, we get pruned. Absolutely. You know, and this past year has been the worst year of pruning. Of, of, it started a year and a half ago. And Susanna commented one day, because God gave us this word about a gold season. And she said, you know, Chris, I think this gold season is the heat's been turned up and all the all the dross has come up and it just looks awful. And it did, and it was. And we had unbelievable stuff happen. Huge things, huge losses. Loss, loss, loss. Loss, loss, loss. And I was talking to a friend of mine two weeks ago, and I said, this has just been re relentless. I've given up that God's ever going to answer my prayers. It's just, and of course, when these things happen, What I always do, I say, Father, thank you for the pruning. Uh, but you're the vine dresser. And you prune us. And I, so I'm offering you these prunings. And you can make these prunings compost. And you can use them to fertilize the future. Or you can burn them. Whatever you want to do. They're yours. I'm going to give you this pruning. And, you know, I'll tell you a little secret about it, being a leader. When someone leaves your house, they take a little piece of you with them. That's a real thing. And I've heard other people say the same thing. Um, it's really true. So it's a painful process. And so you, you have to offer that up to Jesus. And you have to say, okay, Jesus, this is yours. And I'm going to offer this to you. I'm going to agree with you. Because so much in the spiritual life is transactional. And this 
prayer of Jabez is like that. It's a transactional kind of prayer. And we, we hand that off to Jesus. Give it to him. And you know, then the Lord gives you gives it back to you as fruit. And we've seen this in all the best seasons of growth in our house, in our community, over the years, have been these things of pruning and then growth. You know, in some of the best seasons, this, you know, the period before my book, An Army Arising, I had one of the worst experiences of my ministry career happen. I was crucified practically by an organization. And it was and it was out of that that I took some time off and I wrote that book, you know, which nearly everyone on this call is here because of that book. So, you know, God is really good. And so both those books, they they were great books, and it's just amazing how God breathes on things. We do have one one more. You one more. Who's got the last one? I know Rachel, you've got one, don't you? And it's gonna be a whopper. You can just tell me. Just ask it. Okay. Um, how do you graciously address people who think that belonging house is a cult? <laughs> 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 hey, that's great. This is the answer to prayer. You, because... you said it was going to be a whopper of a question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I've just come off two weeks of rest. And one of the, my prayers was like, you know, Lord, I haven't been accused of starting a cult in a long time. Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> Do people ask you this? Do you? Do people ask you this? Um, it's come up recently, yes. Oh, who? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to talk Your about mother. it. Your mother. No. <laughs> how do how would I say? Well, what I used to say to people was if I was starting a cult, first of all, I wouldn't have all these people who do whatever they want. The second thing is if I was starting a cult, I would be making a lot more money than I am. And the third thing is I would uh, have a lot more power than I do. As, as some of you know, I often describe the work that I do as herding cats, which is a group of independent people who do whatever they want and you just let them be. But I can I do see why some people would would be concerned because if you're coming from a completely conventional church grid, what we're doing is very radical. The truth is, though, there's not much about us that's unusual, that's cult-like. I mean, obviously, we've had a lot of people leave, and I didn't go chasing after them. And right there, there's a big thing. Second thing is, we're not a cult because I, uh, it's all Bible, Bible, Bible. I'm about as Bible, Bible as it is. And people are often shocked at how really shockingly conservative and traditional I am. The thing that, you know, some people do would say is, you know, I who we're back to this covering thing and who's your daddy, basically. Who are you aligned with? The truth is the church is in such a massive shift right now. And it's these are the these questions that we've been asked today are really interesting because they are ones I've wrestled with and how to how to say it. And it comes up, you know, sometimes people ask me, who are you canonically aligned with? And which is a big, big, you know, they're all versions of the same question, which is by what authority do you do, do you do these things? Same question that Jesus was asked. And, and always what I say is, well, at the end of the day, yes, I have two advanced degrees in theology and Bible from one of them, one of the most respected or schools in the world that is now, you know, now, you know, when I went there, it didn't have the credibility it does now, but because of the Asbury revival, you know, people say I went to Asbury and the questions cease, which I think is interesting. I had that degree. I've had that degree for 30 years and now it's a much bigger deal than it was. You know, I've, I am grateful. I've sat at the feet of some of the greatest teachers of the last 100 years. And that's true. It's not an exaggeration. 
you you've heard me drop names and it's because they're real people in my life it's not that i was dropping names so <clears throat> at the end of the day you know at this time we're going through a big shift in transition in the world and and i have to always go back to well our authority is scripture we're not doing anything that's let out out of the box except that we are challenging a lot of the the grids from the protestant reformation i would say that's the biggest thing that i'm doing that's radical but i'm not doing it willy-nilly you know i i i I'm doing, my scholarship is better than most of the scholarship I read. And I know this because of what I'm doing. I, it has to be because I'm challenging the status quo. So I have to have my stuff behind me, under me. You know, I have to read Greek every day. I'm reading Hebrew now every day. You know, to, you know I'm writing a book on what the, the, the word artisan really means and its relationship to other words. But if you're coming from a kind of a classic Protestant evangelical grid, what we do looks threatening and scary. We're not the only church on Zoom right now. We're not the only church that's six to 20 people that are independent. Actually, that's the average church on planet Earth right now. And that is, the, that is where the fuel of the growth of Christianity globally is happening in churches that are six to 20 people meeting in out of the box places. But to the United States, especially that's, that's bought into bigger is better. And you have to be under somebody's covering and you have to be aligned with the, the, the mainstream Calvinist grid, you know, that, that came out of Redeemer Presbyterian and the gospel coalition, you know, but that's in terms of global Christianity is actually a very small segment of Christianity. You know, that's what I would say. I would say that when the Nicene Creed becomes the foundation of a cult, then we are in danger. I would also say that if, if people are concerned that I'm a, a cult leader, I just have to give them videos of people screaming at me on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> back at me and people storming away you know and uh you know i'm i'm grateful to god that my my default my default position is still liberal i'm still going to let other people have different points of view and and i think that's that's it i mean i don't know if the truth is if somebody asks you that question they are already suspect and they're not no matter what answer you give them, it's going to be the right one. And I've learned this too. I've learned that when somebody asks you who your covering is, it well, it doesn't matter. Sometimes you just have to be, you know, I've never told anybody to go knock on doors. So, uh, and we do have a very diverse group of people in our community. So from all different churches. So uh, it'd be, yeah, but that, that made me feel better because it feels like maybe I'm doing something right again. So good. <laughs> there have been seasons in my life where I was asked if I was starting a cult, if I was a, be, I was accused of a cult, being a cult leader, I think daily for six months at one point. And I was asked about the covering, who my covering was almost daily for several years. So these are real foundational questions. And they do all go back to the same question, which is, by what authority do you do these things? And you respond, well, John's authority, did it come from God or from men? Because if it was from God, then you should have listened to him. And if it was from men, the, all these people are hundreds of people around the world. What, what's going on with that? So there you go. Praise the Lord. Well, I hope that enlightened you. And uh, we'll do it again. We might do it again in two years again. Who knows? So, amen. Thanks for listening. If these messages have helped you, please like, subscribe, support, and share. 
You can find out more about Belonging House Fellowship in the description. No matter what's happening in your life, remember, fear not, God can be trusted.